Good afternoon to everyone and a very warm welcome to you on behalf of the CDAC network. Uh, we are very much looking forward to you joining us today for the opening of the CDAC network annual general assembly, where we will advance CDAC's commitments to systematizing two-way communication and engagement with communities affected by crisis. Today is the start of four days of internal as well as publicly facing events where we have the opportunity to reflect, to learn, and to strategize together. Later this week, we will be pleased to invite you to join the CDAC Public Forum, which this year has the title, Digital Communication and Accountability, Is Technology Tipping the Balance of Power and Aid? However, to start with, I am delighted to welcome the United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, and Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffiths to open our General Assembly. Thank you for this opportunity to address your annual General Assembly. It's an honor to address such a broad range of organizations. First, let me commend you all on the enormous contributions you have made over the past decade to strengthen the system's accountability to affected people, or AAP. In particular, I acknowledge your essential role in bringing together grassroots organizations as well as international and making sure local people have a place in global forums so they can tell us finally and clearly and exactly what they need and what they want. Together, we have demonstrated how communication and information sharing with communities who need our help is essential to building trust and achieving respectful and effective engagement. I'm also deeply committed to ensuring our own accountability to those communities, committed to playing my part in ensuring a collective accountability for the entire humanitarian community on this issue. As of now, progress is certainly mixed. It's clear that well over 100 women were sexually exploited during the Ebola response operations in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Our official humanitarian system didn't find out about it quickly enough and didn't do enough about it when they had. This is a damning example of how far we have to go with participation and feedback. When aid agencies don't listen, they aren't just ineffective, they undermine their own legitimacy and our collective values. In better news, in Ethiopia, one of the most challenging operations we face, we're using surveys and feedback to make a community voices dashboard to help steer the clusters, the planning base for the humanitarian program, and also coordination. It can be done. We've seen it can be done. We've seen it must be done. And I intend to push OCHA and the humanitarian system towards improvement. Communities are always the first responders in a crisis, and they are active and essential partners in determining the type of response and support they seek. The renewed commitments of the Grand Bargain 2.0 push us to recognize that different countries and contexts require different types of engagement. This is not a particularly unusual thought. We're working to put policy, therefore, into practice by improving the support to humanitarian leaders and practitioners on AAP and ensuring they have improved tools and guidance to do their job. I urge you to continue to bring us together around a common understanding of accountability to affected people, to honor a common understanding of community engagement and a common communications with communities to achieve these ends. Help us move beyond the acronyms to gain real consensus around our work and our commitments. Together, we need to look hard at how we listen to affected people and understand how we can give them what they want, what they need, and what they seek. 
In doing this, we create a humanitarian system that is more dignified, that is more accountable, and makes better use of scarce resources. So finally, I wish you well as you embark on the next five years with a new strategy and vision to strengthen the ongoing communication with the people and communities we serve and who need our help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, um, for those inspiring and heartfelt op opening remarks. I think they serve to show us the importance of being open and being direct and engaging with ourselves as well as those that we aspire to serve. And continuing this opening session, we will now have our opening panel on accountability and inclusion in practice which will be moderated by CDAC's Executive Director, Marion Casey Maslin. So over to you, Marion. Thank you, Jeff. As we begin our annual General Assembly, we are reminded that our new multi-year strategy commits us to using the collective clout of the CDAC network to try to reverse the focus of humanitarian and development nexus decision-making moving from global to local. Um, I am delighted to be asking our guests today about accountability and inclusion in practice from their own leadership perspectives. Our guests are all representatives of CDAC network member organizations, and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Henia Dakat, the head of policy and liaison unit for UNFPA, Paul Chigwe, the Monitoring, Evaluation and Accountability and Learning Manager for World Vision Syria Response. Paul covers Jordan, Syria and Turkey. And Nick Van Prague, the Founder and Director of Ground Truth Solutions. We've just heard from the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator, Martin Griffiths, and he has put the spotlight on the need for greater accountability within the humanitarian system. This, of course, demands a debate far beyond accountability experts. What it is out there that prevents accountability from moving from a popular topic to ruminate on, which we have all done a lot of in the humanitarian sector for the past two to three decades now, to something that affects change in the way we program aid. So let's begin by getting your views. Nick. You're a leading voice on accountability in your own organization, Ground Truth Solutions. What a, was your reaction to Martin Griffith's opening remarks? What do you see as the main challenge ahead of him when it comes to AAP? Nick, if you can unmute. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thanks, Marion. Um, it's great to have Martin um, as, as, a, as a sort of lead speaker in the program. And I thought uh, it was extremely encouraging to hear what he had to say. Um, he clearly intends to sort of pick up the, the, the flame from his predecessor and, and put a lot of emphasis on uh, accountability. Um, I was also pleased to hear he wants to push for improvement. Uh, he certainly is not satisfied. He sees that there's a long way to go, to quote his words back to him. And um, putting policy into practice seems to be a really important thing. I'm not sure if just improved rules and guidance are going to do the job. I think we have a plethora of rules and guidance uh, around this topic. I think what's really necessary is extremely strong leadership, which he sounds as though he is going to provide at the very top of the system. I think that's something that needs to trickle down or cascade down to humanitarian coordinators and every other member of the humanitarian country teams over which they preside. I would say on the AAP front, really important that leadership sees accountability to affected people, not as a discrete set of activities around providing information and ensuring that helplines are in place, as important as those things might be. I think it's really important that he emphasizes and his colleagues emphasize that AAP or accountability to affected people relates to absolutely everything uh, that is done in the name of humanitarian action. It needs to inform everything 
um, that we as humanitarians do. It's at the core of uh, humanitarianism, if you like. It's not an add-on or a nice to have. And that means not so much rules uh, and guidance as, as useful as they may be for people who are uh, looking for, for, for those things. What's really important is that we get the incentives right, that people feel that it's absolutely essential that they move ahead. There's a lot in it uh, for the system, there's a lot in it for them as individuals. And I think we need to really look uh, closely at a range of positive incentives, um, funding those programs which demonstrate a real um, determination to be accountable. Um, promotions, um, um, good new jobs for people who've demonstrated their bona fides in this area. Um, I think that, that those are the kinds of things that are really necessary. And when it comes to systems, uh, it's all very well um, to, 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 to think about guidance, but what you really need are systems and systems uh, that enable people in leadership positions to understand what it is that the people are saying and to then act on what they hear. Uh, and so one needs to have systems in place where on a regular basis, in a systematic way, you're able to track the way uh, perceptions are evolving, the way people see things and um, react um, as is necessary. That's when we will really get closer to true accountability. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. And um, Henia, what is your reaction and, and what do you see as the ERC's key challenge? Um, thank you, uh, Marianne. I, th I think um, uh, Martin has, you know, you know, he, he understands the issue and I think he, he really um, uh, honed on some of the main uh, challenges that we are having. The system is not uh, as agile as it should be. That's for sure, you know, bureaucracy still permeates a lot of the issues that we are dealing with in many places. But I think what we need to, to really, in order to make sure accountability is working for everybody is, is really making sure that people who are affected in humanitarian situations are at the center of, of the work. They are not an add-on, they are why we are there. And not, you know, like we are there just, you know, I mean, to do our work. We are there to serve what they need. And, and unless we really communicate with them and understand them and, and really give them the tools to be able to tell us what they need, I think we will not reach where we want to reach. I think it's going to still being something like we are parachuting people who don't understand the culture don't understand the community, don't speak the same language. And we end up, you know, with the same situation where we, uh, you know, we are not listening anymore uh, because we are going about our business like as usual without really thinking our, how we are doing our business in a more quality uh, way that is really at the center where these people at the center and we are just there to serve them and facilitate their access, their uh, their, uh, their, you know, their information, their issues, uh, and really participate with them in designing whatever uh, programs we need to do. So quality programming is very important. Again, we have to go back to the rights. Uh, is it our rights or is it their rights that we have to defend and, and work for? And that's something I think we should really go back to the, to the basic. It's a human reason, it's a human centered and it has to be a rights based approach that will work for everybody. And I think for UNFP, we have really set up this as, as our way of doing our rights based approach in, in, uh, in, in working in humanitarian setting is really about also making sure that we protect the rights. And at the same time, of course, there are humanitarian principles that we need to abide by, but at the same time, we cannot forget that we are a UN and we are there because of the rights of the people that we need to serve. Over to you, Marianne. Thank you, Henia. And I'm going to see if Paul maybe disagrees or agrees with, with uh, both of the, both yours and Nick's uh, comments. So Paul, over to you, what's your reaction 
uh, to the ERC's um, opening remarks and the greatest challenges you believe from where you sit currently that he faces. Uh, thank you very much, Marianne. Listening to what Martin has shared with us in the, his opening remarks, I get the feeling that uh, he knows, he has an idea of the job at hand um, and what needs to be done. For instance, um, he talks about the need to support the, the practitioners of humanitarian accountability. He mentioned uh, about um, the number of women who, who the hundred women who were affected in, in DRC, the Bora response. So um, looking at that, uh, he also mentions about um, the need to listen to the communities. I think that is key, but uh, still that is not enough. Uh, as a practitioner of accountability, and so much passionate about it, I've learned that uh, we can listen and listen and put as many mechanisms in place as possible to receive feedback. But if we do not act on that feedback, all is in vain. And uh, that's where I call upon him to focus on building a critical mass to respond to the feedback and complaints from our communities and also to avail resources needed to respond to these uh, feed, to the feedback and complaints from the communities. But from where I sit, I think he's on track. Good luck, Martin. Thank you, over. Thanks, Paul. So good advice um, to the new ERC, and we'll hear more from you on that as we as we proceed in this session. Um, I'm going to now turn towards our General Assembly and during our General Assembly, we'll be coming together around our new strategy and reflecting on how our work can continue to drive our central vision of shifting power and also shifting the, the focus on decision making. And um, Hinia, if I may, I'm going to direct a question at you. Um, we all know publicly that UNFPA is a signatory of the, the grand bargain and has endorsed the interagency standing committee commitments on accountability to affected populations. You've also integrated, I see in your report, uh, AAP into your emergency response and your standard operating procedures. So what is UNFPA doing differently at the community level, especially since it signed up to the grand bargain and on the two commitments in particular around the participation revolution and localization. Over to yeah. you, Henia. Uh, thank you, Marianne. I, I think from our side, you know, like we have taken, I think the aspects of localization to heart and, and the way we have been trying really to do our work is really making sure that resources, especially, you know, uh, financial resources and capacity uh, resources are dedicated to women-led and youth-led organizations. And that has been, you know, community-led. And, and this has been really um, like well documented in the sense we, we actually have a tracking system in place. So we have put a system in place to be able to track how much resources are going from, you know, uh, from our donors. Of course, you know, they are not UNFPA resources, they are donor resources, but tracking them to the community to make sure that you know the community is capable of making their own decisions and and designing their own programs and really our role there is as a supportive system so i think from our side is really and and supporting them to really build their capacity so we also have grants for local NGOs to build their own capacity. They, they don't have to really do anything uh, related to programming, but it is a grants that they get in order to really build the system in place in order for them. Because I think currently still for many uh, local NGOs and local uh, civil society and, and local actors and community actors, there is difficulty in accessing funding from, uh, from humanitarian because of like the like 
our processes are complicated and sometimes it's very difficult for them to access funding. And therefore you need to, first of all, build their capacity so that they have systems in place that they can do that. But at the same time, we have to have a system in place within our own organization to track and, and really document how we are providing that funding and what where the funding is going. So we, we have to do this double work. But I think the issue of getting out of, of what is just, you know, like, um, a, a, a theme like localization without really making it practical, making it uh, 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 workable, actionable for our country office and our staff, it will still be, you know, like, okay, it's a policy, but there is no implementation of that policy. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Henia. And I'm going to build on that and go to Paul. Paul, we know you're sitting in Jordan currently, but you recently moved uh, from your Uganda office and the refugee response there, where you led a core humanitarian standard self-assessment. Now, you're now sitting uh, where the action is, and we're often talking at the global level. How much relevance do you think there is to these global discussions and the standards and to the work that actually happens at the country level? Thank you very much, Marianne. Um, I would say with the other confidence that there is a strong relevancy for the SHS assessment um, on the ground. And uh, I'm saying this basing on my experience in the Uganda Refugee Response of World Division. Uh, as you mentioned, I led assessment that was in May 2019. And um, to say that there is a strong relationship and relevance is based on the benefits that we achieved from the exercise. And I'll quickly mention three major ones. The first one is that um, the assessment gave us an evidence base of the gaps that existed in our accountability system. Secondly, as we conducted assessment, um, being that it was very participative, it gave us a platform to advocate and create awareness around AAP within the entire response team. Then the other stakeholders like the communities we serve, Office of the OPM and other um, stakeholders that we interacted with as we gathered information for the assessment. Thirdly, when we looked at the, the findings, we had to come up with um, an improvement plan to fill the gaps. And I, I want to say that from the improvement plan, we had about three or four um, areas that we, want, we focused on, but I'll talk more about one, that is our, um, building the capacity within the response to implement accountability. And um, what we agreed from the onset was that the entire mail system will take lead and at that time, there were about 43 staff. So from one person, we came up with uh, a team of 43 people keen and focused on implementing accountability. Um, we also um, decided to say, look, we don't have the in-house staff. What do we do? And that's how we reached out to the Global Center team, they came down and supported us. And um, the core team escalated the same support training to the entire um, staff within the response. And I want to share that um, from that, we started seeing results in the communities. How? Firstly, we had the number of feedback coming through our information feedback systems rising up like the trophy line, the reflection meetings. So it's, um, we realized that the quality of um, accountability in the communities was improving. So if we are getting feedback and because the entire team, including the program staff had been educated or sensitized about the importance of accountability. We had everyone concerned to respond to the feedback that was coming. So the timeliness also improved. So in short, I want to say 
that it's a very, very good process. And I will encourage every organization, wherever they are, if they can, to do that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks very much, Paula. That's a very positive note. And uh, Nick, um, let's see if you continue in that vein. You set up Ground Truth Solutions, and I think the name is a giveaway in itself, a decade ago, with a mission to put people at the center of humanitarian action. Now that participation and accountability occupy such a central role as drivers of humanitarian reform, do you really feel able to move on and evolve from there? And where are the main barriers now that you see? And where has been the most uh, success and advancement? And Nick, if you can unmute again. Sorry. Uh, when we set up Ground Truth a decade or so ago, our feeling was that if you could bring in the perspective of people who are affected by humanitarian crises, um, that would make a difference. And the missing piece was actually being able to bring um, that intelligence to the, to the table. And we, we've been doing that for quite a long time now. And that in and of itself is certainly not enough. Um, we, 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 we've done a lot of work around, you know, making sure that the way we report the data is as compelling as possible. We've um, done a lot of analysis, analysis of the data together with people running those programs. We've come up with uh, means of tracking progress through the eyes of the affected population in the form of, of performance indicators linked to people's perceptions. And I think Nick is having some difficulties with his internet currently. And uh, we, I think we're just back, Nick. Go ahead. So we're losing you every now and again. Go ahead. We've we continually evolved, if you like, uh, in search of the Holy Grail. Um, and it really, I mean, I think we're historical success. Um, and it's great to see so much emphasis. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just saying that I was just trying to say that, you know, what we've been doing has been a kind of process of evolution, if you like. We're, we're constantly trying to bring this perspective to bear centrally on um, the, the decision-making process, but it's hard. And I think increasingly we, we, we've tried to really embed ourselves in the architecture of humanitarian action, uh, using the humanitarian response plan um, as, as, as an important platform and tracking people's perceptions against progress towards meeting the goals set out in those plans. But I think we're increasingly asking ourselves the question, you know, embedding oneself in the architecture is one thing. The other question is, well, is the architecture right? Is the architecture fit for purpose? And that's something I, I, I think that the recent report from the uh, Center for Global Development uh, in Washington has provided a lot of food for thought about how we can provide an architecture within which it's more likely that people's perspectives will be taken into account. I think it's really great that we're all focused on this as a, a priority. I think we're quite far from being able to coax the system uh, into really listening up and acting hard. Thank you, Nick. Um, quite a lot to reflect on in that um, session. I think we're now going to consider that but move on to looking to the future and you've already aired a few points on what we can change in the future not just at the action level but also at the systems level so as we look to the future and consider what we've learned um i think in cdf we think it's critical to consider some of the more lucid and dynamic topics of conversation and to run with some of the optimism around better support for protection more local responses and inclusion uh, with improved advancement in digital access. Um, there's a lot about digital communication currently. So Paul, if I could direct a question to you, um, particularly in the wake of COVID-19, um, the role of digital communication and technology uh, is often deemed to be driving better engagement of communities uh, in humanitarian assistance. And indeed, uh, since the beginning of this year, CDAC has been very hopeful that such communications, such digital communications would lead to better accountability with new ideas for increasing local actions and dialogue. But nearly a year on, it all seems less positive now 
Uh, do you think this is the case from where you sit? Uh, thank you very much, Marianne, for that question. But uh, reflecting on that question, I think it will be doing it a lot of injustice to give a blanket response. And uh, on that note, I request that you allow me to contextualize the question. And uh, I'm going to look at um, the Uganda refugee response and the Syria response. And uh, I'll say the Uganda re refugee response in that case will say, yes, not much has been achieved. And um, the future is not that very bright. Why? Because um, we conducted uh, an accountability assessment for the response, asking the beneficiaries, the communities, a number of questions. And one of them was, do you have a mobile phone? Over 73% of the, the, the respondents say they didn't have. Then two, the other question was, what is the most preferred mechanism for, would, for receiving feedback and giving information to our division. And over 90% said they would prefer face-to-face -face interaction. So that means that uh, in such a context, going digital is to require a lot of effort. For instance, if we think of WhatsApp, do you have the resources to support the communities access smartphones? No. So from that side, I'll say we are not yet there. But again, where I sit now in the Syria response, the situation calls for us to smile about it and be happy that there is progress. And I will share that um, around uh, the beginning of this year, we conducted a rapid assessment to understand, especially with the call for social distancing and also with the desire for us to continue reaching out to the beneficiaries and communities to hear their views. We reached out to them to ask a few questions. And one of them was still about access to phone, to a mobile phone. Over 72% say they had access and majority say to smartphone. So that calls for, for us to smile and be happy that there is hope. Then the second question was, what is your preferred method to receive and give feedback? Between 43 and 48 mentioned WhatsApp messaging and Facebook messaging. So looking at that, you realize that in this context, there is a lot of progress and the future looks very, very bright. Because last slide, I'll just close with this, that um, even data from our monthly accountability reports, we have over 43 on average feedback coming through WhatsApp and, and Facebook messaging. So on that note, I'll say we need to conceptualize, contextualize the, um, the question to be able to answer these questions. But in general, I think the future is bright. Thank you so much. Over. Thank you, Paul, for those two excellent and revealing examples. And I'm going to see if Nick can build on that by continuing to talk to local action, Nick. You know, as the focus within the humanitarian system shifts towards local and national players, do you think that we are ready for change in the sector? And what does change in action look like from your perspective? And another question, what do you see as the role of small organizations, small in, in the size of the numbers there, but large in other ways, like Ground Truth Solutions, and others in the humanitarian to humanitarian fold, such as CDEX Net Network, that have cut their teeth as service providers to the established players? Right, I think, well, this, this, that, you know, clearly as we move towards a, an approach to humanitarian action, which is, is, um, is, is far more focused on uh, provision by national and, and local organizations. I think it will be extremely important to make sure that these organizations are um, sort of aware of and um, practicing the kinds of 
approaches that perhaps the international players have been talking about for rather longer. Many of them, of course, have worked with international organizations and are familiar with some of these presets. Um, but I think it will be very important to uh, work with uh, national and local organizations to make sure that they are aware of um, the, these, kinds of, these kinds of issues and the, the centrality of placing people at the center. So I think there's a lot of work to do on mentoring and capacity building. And we're actually working with CDAC, a, a project led by CDAC, funded by uh, the Australian government in the Pacific, uh, building up the capacity of um, national uh, and local organizations to, um, to be more accountable to the people um, of the lands uh, that they're living in. Um, I think we as, as, as smallish organizations can play an important role in, in nudging uh, those groups uh, in the right direction. Uh, we've also been working for the last year and a half with Weltwunger Hilfe, actually for longer than that, working with 14 organizations in Afghanistan uh, to uh, help them um, become um, effective actors in terms of being accountable to those they serve. Just one last point, I think, uh, and it's something that was quite central to the outgoing emergency relief coordinator's suggestions on accountability to affected people. And it features also in the uh, report I cited earlier from the Center for Global Development in Washington. And that is to have some kind of independent view on how humanitarian action is going. So I think it will be really important whether uh, the, 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 the main providers are international or national, um, it will remain important to ensure that there is some kind of independent overview uh, on whether or not people who are supposed to um, benefit, to use that word, uh, from humanitarian action are actually doing so. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Nick. Um, and then, Penny, if you can build on that yet again, you talked earlier also about systems change and opportunities that may have arisen in uh, recent years. Um, however, each year, uh, new allegations, for example, of sexual exploitation and abuse uh, by both national and international staff continue to be reported. Uh, and there are harrowing facts that have also been highlighted by the ERC today in his opening address. Um, in your opinion, what are the key structural failures that need to be addressed from an accountability perspective to better protect people that are vulnerable to abuse? And in your response, if you could maybe go beyond agencies, especially the UN agencies, going beyond their intentional efforts to listen, engage, and adapt. For example, we, we talked uh, on a number of occasions about the Interagency Standing Committee. Uh, who or what mechanism will hold the IAC to account for its collective actions or inactions, specifically linked to sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment? It's not an easy question, but over to you. Uh, thank you. No, Maria, you, you really gave me the toughest question to answer. Uh, one of the things that I think, you know, I mean, uh, even with the ISC, and I, I, I go back also to the work that Mark started uh, uh, as the emergency relief coordinator before Martin, uh, this whole thing about championship within the ISC and having, you know, a champion within the interagency standing committee that basically also like holds the baton, you know what I mean? And, and really hold uh, the ISC uh, principles accountable in terms of addressing uh, uh, sexual exploitation and abuse in humanitarian setting. I think that's that has been very important. And I think, you know, having also resources to address the issue is very important, not only from the UN perspective, but also from the NGO. And I know, you know, for many uh, NGOs, they have already signed on uh, a code of conduct, you know, we have the policy, we have the code of conduct, we have a lot of issues already in place. And I think what is still missing um, is really uh, a, a, like, let us say a survivor centered approach is not there. Until now, we blame the victim until now. Okay, we almost, you know, the investigation takes six months. Uh, to be done or to really uh, get somebody to to really investigate uh, an allegation or or not an allegation but really true situations where we are not listening and we are not you know uh, 
seeing what's going on. This is very concerning. And I think what we have tried to do, and I, we came out from three days of workshop where we brought the people who are working on gender-based violence and sexual and ex exploitation and abuse and talked about how do we collaborate? How do we bring you know, uh, bridges? How do we bridge? Because in the end of the day, even the people within organizations that have been exposed to sexual exploitation and sexual harassment within their workplace, they have no support system still, okay? They are still, you know, not really provided with all the multi-sectoral support that they need to get as, you know, as survivors of uh, sexual harassment or sexual exploitation and abuse. And I think that's something that we really collectively need to do. I know UNFPA now, you know, our, uh, like our executive director, Natalia Kanem is currently the champion. Uh, she's the champion for the ISC on sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment. And she's, she's trying, you know, I mean, to really uh, move this further by listening. First of all, she was in DRC and she did a whole uh, segment where she talked and listened to the women themselves who have been exposed to sexual exploitation and abuse. And, and she has really, you know, I mean, this type of like really listening and understanding and having that that dialogue with them in order to see what she can do. But one of the things we are also doing is raising, you know, like uh, really training a roster of sexual exploitation and abuse uh, 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 coordinators that can go on the ground in different places and be like the watchdogs that basically Nick was talking about, at least independently, you know what I mean? They are not related to any agency. They, they, they really are um, coordinators for the interagency perspective. And they are going to be the ones who basically will alert us. They will have a mechanism to alert us and make sure that we address the issues. Unless we have also ability to really support and protect the, uh, the whistleblowers, uh, it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? We have to put systems in place, but at the same time, we have to really um, be champions ourselves, each one of us, you know, I will be going to Afghanistan, one of the issues that I will be looking at also currently, you know what I mean, is this issue. So I think each one of us and, and the, the executive director, she has, she is going to be in a retreat with the resident coordinators now, you know, where she talks again about sexual exploitation and abuse and what we need to do as each one of us is really responsible. I don't think it's a collective responsibility in the end of the day that we do something about this. Over to you, Marianne. Um, thank you very much, Henny. And I know you're poised, waiting to get on the plane to go to Afghanistan. And so we're, we're very uh, delighted that you joined us before that. It's, um, there are many different reports coming from these countries where I think we are going to have to step up our individual and collective efforts. Um, can I, we're coming to the final set of questions. The audience I know has a number of questions they would like to ask. And if anybody has any top burning issue, please share it in the chat box now while we go on and ask our final question to each in the, to each of our guests today. Um, there's one burning question that I would have if I were the, if I were Martin Griffiths, the, the ERC. Um, if you were, let me start with Henia. You've just finished your, your question, Henia. If you were the UN Emergency Response Coordinator, what one action would you take in your next 12 months to ensure that accountability towards affected people of crisis is considered as part of an overall reform of the humanitarian system? So system issues. Over to you, Annie, and I'll come to Paul next. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I, I think, I think uh, uh, if I was the ERC, I think one of the things that I will, uh, will do is first of all, you know what I mean? I want to have like a um, uh, sort of uh, principles that everybody can abide with. You know, everybody knows about them and, and they are internalized and each uh, agency will do their own thing, you know what I mean? To make sure that this happens. But collectively, we also have sort of, we, we 
uh, hold ourselves accountable to certain uh, elements that we will do everywhere. And one of them is really uh, a two-way uh, conversation with the communities. And I, I do like the, the idea that Nick has, you know, put forward is where we, we do need watchdogs, you know, that, that basically like uh, really watching us and, and making sure we do what we need to do, because I think that's, it's very important aspects also to really be the, the alert system. I think currently in the humanitarian work, you know, we do talk about anticipatory action, but I think we need anticipatory action for, you know, preventing sexual exploitation and abuse. And we need also accountable, you know, like uh, anticipatory action on communicating with affected population ahead of time and understanding. Look, you know, again, everybody's talking about uh, like uh, the food situation and, you know, the alert, like the, the, the food insecurity that's happening at the moment and the famine. And we know like, we have an alert system and still, you know, within the alert system, we are not putting the resources. And I think we need to dedicate resources for, you know, accountability. And we need to really make sure that, you know, like, we do review and we do the evaluation. There are interagency evaluation, and one of them was really on gender. Now, you know, I mean, we need to see how are they doing on, a, like, you know, an evaluation, interagency evaluation on accountability, you know, like to affected population. And are we doing what we need to do on, in terms of each agency? I would suggest, you know, we will do an evaluation and then, you know, map up what we need to do as, as we go along. Over to you, Marianne. Thank you very much, Henia. And Paul, can you build on your previous responses and tell us what is that action the ERC should be doing in these first 12 months? First of all, it's a difficult question, but I, I'll try to attempt it basing on my experience in accountability. And uh, I'll say, I'm saying that uh, it's a difficult question, but I, I will attempt it based on my experience in humanitarian accountability. And I'll say that um, that one thing that I'll, that I'll break, on, break down is uh, for Martin to focus on coming up with a structured approach to advocate for accountability and also create awareness. There is a lot going on, but what we need is something structured and deliberate. Then to um, still under, uh, under advocacy is to work around, support the stakeholders, organizations, access resources to implement accountability. And lastly, to support the existing structures. There are lots of structures going on processes going on, but can we, can they be supported? We don't need something new at the moment. We need to support the existing structures and processes. Thank you and good luck, Martin, again, over. Thank you very much, Paul. And, and I'm going to put Nick next in the hot seat. And can I just preface this, Nick, by saying, I've now been listening to the accountability discussion for over three decades. And you've talked about some changes that uh, might need to be uh, put into the system in your earlier comments. Can you maybe build on that? So what would the ERC be looking at in the first 12 months? Right, well, I think he, he first of all, what he really needs to do is to demonstrate that his role is relevant in building the kind of responsive system that he was talking about and that we're all talking about. And, um, you know, like any good CEO, a good sort of CEO of a company that is kind of customer facing will look at two things. They'll look at their share price and they'll look at how uh, their customers' feedback suggests the company is doing. And so I would suggest that what he needs to do is to focus laser like both clearly on the sort of fundraising side of his brief, but secondly, he needs to focus really closely on how people see humanitarian action, which is taking place under the umbrella for which he is responsible. That would be the most important thing that he could do in my view. And that means having um, strong feedback mechanisms, 
uh, strong metrics for tracking those feed, for tracking that feedback, and uh, really, really important putting in place uh, both the incentives to make sure that things get done because there's a ton of talk, not much action at the moment, and um, the funding. I think you're know, picking up on what Paul was saying to make sure that funding is available uh, to do these things in the in the places where we're active. Uh, in, in many different parts of the world, we are invariably responsible for raising uh, the resources to do the work. It doesn't come from the system itself. So here we have a system which is basically marking its own homework uh, and, and, and provision of independent uh, feedback is, 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 is really only available at the margins. That needs to be brought into center stage. And I think that will really ensure uh, that Martin's impact and, and the relevance of the organization will be enhanced. Thanks, Mary. Um, thanks so much, Nick, for that. Um, we've come to that uh, roundup of your perspectives for the ERC for the, the coming 12 months. And uh, I'm going to give each of you an opportunity to follow up on any aspects that you hadn't covered earlier. But I'm also going to call on our wonderful CDAC members who are in the audience uh, to see if there is any aspect that they may be supported or objected to that were raised during today's uh, discussion. And if anybody would like to uh, give us their feedback on this session so far. Is there anything you felt that we are promoting for systems change or for changing actions over the next 12 months, especially linked to accountability towards affected populations that we should be bringing higher on our agenda as we start off with our annual General Assembly of Members. Over to our audience for any brave person who wants to, uh, to comment. Hi, Marian. This is Noreen. Go ahead, Noreen. And Noreen, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi, everybody. I'm, um, I'm Noreen Nakvi, and I'm working as a Communication for Development Humanitarian Action Specialist uh, based at New York headquarters with UNICEF, um, also leading the RCCE for COVID-19 from my team, and also looking at all the other humanitarian emergencies crisis across the globe. So, um, this topic, this issue is very, very close to my heart. I've been in the field for a very long time before coming here. So just want to say two things. Um, and, and thanks Marianne for starting off with this session because I think this is the most important and critical one. We all know that um, Afghanistan of course is right in front of us and so many others. So uh, uh, when are we really going to learn from the experiences that we are having and the challenges that we've been facing? Um, are we ready to ask ourselves very critical, difficult questions or not? Because I have seen throughout my career and I still see it, all the good coordination mechanisms that we have during humanitarian crisis, any emergency. We know, I mean, it's an opportunity, different partners come and they sit around the same table. It's a golden opportunity for us. We go beyond our organizational hats and you know, we sit with each other. So how are we leveraging those coordination mechanisms? As uh, I, I just heard the presenter said, um, it's two way, you know, it's really not just about the policies and resource mobilization. The other part of building capacity to act or actual people investing in their capacity is the key if you really want to do it. Because we all know that in Syria, there is no access. What are we going to do? Even if we have the most beautiful um, policy or, 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 or a document or the system in UNICEF, it's not going to work when the people themselves are not empowered. So we uh, have to, somebody just mentioned localization, really translate those brilliant ideas into actions. And if we could do the localization in, in its true sense, we will be empowering people. People are still scared of talking, you know, speaking. We need to understand like people in, let's say Syria, they will not say anything, even if they are unhappy about something. They, they are scared of humanitarian 
uh, workers on ground who are wearing agencies jackets and we suddenly become like United Nations and all we don't really reach communities at the same level as they are local the same as they are and speak the same language you know so we really need to now do the things that we have not been doing so well we have done a lot of brilliant good work and i can give you so many examples where things worked but how they worked why they worked was because we used the local people to do the task build their capacity all the money that we brought was invested in local capacity. And Nigeria is one of the examples. Nobody else can uh, go to the, you know, in, in Medigori, in Northeast Nigeria, you, we all know that, you know, the access issues are there, the problems are there. So how, what do we do? So we developed the local structure of community mobilizers. They live in their communities. We keep building their capacities. That's the only hope in that area for us. So just want to say that, um, um, this is the only thing I wanted to say, basically, you know, I mean, I, I, will, I would love to have a better, longer discussion, maybe at some other time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Noreen. And I will give final, the final response to all of our panelists in the end, but I want to maybe um, share some of the comments that we're getting in the chat box. Um, and I'm not sure, maybe the commentators would like to speak themselves, or would you like me to comment on your behalf? Uh, I'll open the floor to see if our two uh, people who've commented would like to share the comment themselves. Hey, Marianne, uh, Louise Tunbridge here from International Media Support, IMS. Hi, Louise, go ahead. Hi there, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just struck uh, when one of your speakers mentioned um, conducting assessments as part of sort of the watchdog role to keep track of how we're doing in this uh, adventure, if you like. Um, in Somalia, as an example, uh, it's a country where IMS has a large program and uh, there's a locally led conversation going on. I guess it's about who owns the local story and uh, you know who conducts uh, local research, who gets to see all of these assessments and papers um, that are generated by the humanitarian community. There's a strong perception that they're kept secret um, and at the very least, I think it's true that they're not very accessible um, because of the language that they're written in and the modes or modalities of sharing um, these assessments and these reports um, shared in elite circles, you might say. And I just wondered if any of your panelists think this is an issue, um, how can it be improved? Um, thank you. Thank you, Louise, for that. Um, would any of our panelists like to take a lead on responding? Nick, do I see your hand up there? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Louise. I think that's a really important point. And this, this comes back to the whole business of, you know, extractive, the extractive nature of so much um, of feedback collection. I think it's really important not just to collect data about the way people see things, to put in a report, to then send on up the line, but to go back to communities, uh, discuss it with them, try and discover why they're saying the things they're saying and what might be their ideas for, for, for resolving some of the problems. One of the issues I think we all face is that the, the, the data we collect often poses uh, more questions than it actually resolves. And it's really important to see this in a kind of one or two or even three stage process where you go back to communities, as I say, discuss the data with them and then formulate a report which brings their perspective more centrally into view. And what we do these days is to make recommendations which are based on the recommendations that we hear from communities, not just on their perspective on certain issues we may raise with them. That's really interesting, but it's not enough. I remember when we were working in the Caribbean after the hurricanes, Maria and Irma a few years back, and we would do this, go back to communities with CDAC actually, um, and, um, people would say, uh, we, would, we, would, we would summarize the feedback we would, that, that, that was then aggregated to give people a general sense of what, 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 what was the, the, the sense of the communities. And they then said to us, well, we know that, we know what we think, what are you gonna do about it? So it comes back yet again to the business of taking action and making sure the incentives are in place to ensure that happens. Thanks very much, Nick. And I have another comment in the box. And if, if um, the person who shared it would like to speak, uh, go ahead. But uh, if not, I will share it on their behalf. 
Um, one comment in the box says, I would love to see the emergency response coordinator shaping a new humanitarian architecture that enables AAP, as our colleagues in the panel have mentioned before, and invite the ERC to review the history. That is Jan Eglin's 205, 2005 work promoting transformative humanitarian action, and perhaps also join forces with Yen on the Grand Bargain 2.0. So it's a practical action, a deeper review of the system and how we move forward. Um, I'm going to give a, a final chance to our three panelists to add one final comment, and then we will bring this session to a close. If any of our panelists would like to say one final word. Henia, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think that the, the comments or the question that came is very interesting. You know, I, 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 I was one of the people who also worked with Ian England when he was the emergency relief coordinator uh, within the UN. And, you know, I see him now as the head of NRC and, and talking a lot about, you know, accountability and how can we do things better. I, th I think what, like, the humanitarian uh, community has done a lot of reform over the years. I, let me say, I go back to my own experience. Uh, uh, I didn't come to the UN without experience working in the civil society and NGOs and international and local NGOs. So I have worked through the system in, in different, uh, in different uh, incarnation, let us say, in different uh, roles. Uh, but in reality, what I have seen that we have done some progress. Of course, it is not as good as we want it to be. And it's always, there is room always to improve. And I think that's the issue is that we have to really be honest about what is what is wrong and, and really try to, to find solution and find ways of improving things. And I, maybe, you know what I mean, the ERC needs to champion accountability. Maybe that's one of the things that we could, you know what I mean, uh, take him on and say, okay, can you put as one of your targets that you want to work on is accountability and really address that. I think the, the issue of evaluation that came out before, uh, we make evaluation available in different languages now. We make you know a summary, very quick summary. We go back to, to the communities where we have done the evaluation and talk with them again before any recommendations comes that. I think we have come a long way, but we still can improve. And I do think you know the, the grand bargain to 2.1 Oh, you know what I mean, would be important also because that commitment has really forced us to do certain things because we committed ourselves to do this. I think it's important that we have these commitments or principles and we adhere to them and we try to measure what we are doing because without measurement, we will never achieve what we want to do. Over. Thanks, Henia. Paul, would you like to con conclude uh, from any final aspect? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, whenever I get a microphone to speak about accountability, I struggle to stop, but this time around, I want to say one thing, that uh, in implementing accountability, we need to be deliberate, deliberate, deliberate. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for that, those wise words. And Nick, your final point. My, my final point, I guess, is that I think and I was talking yesterday to Merva Shobaya, the head of the IASC secretariat, and she was saying, well, maybe for accountability to 20 people, we just need to make it simpler. And I would say, no, no, we may make it more complicated because we need to recognize that it's at the center of everything we do. But the more I think about it, the more right she is. I think we really do need to adopt a simpler approach. And we need to make sure that the rewards are in place not for just ticking the usual boxes, fixing, you know, setting up a complaints mechanism here or doing something else there, but, but for running a response in a way uh, that takes people's views into account. Sort of like, um, you know, we heard this, we did that, uh, and we're tracking the impact and, and the outcomes for the local population. That's, I think, what we need to be doing. And if, 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 we, can, if we can achieve that, that will be a huge step forward. Uh, so I guess my message is, uh, radical simplification. Okay, we have, thank you so much for that, Nick. 
Um, it brings me to the point where we're going to say this is the close of this panel session and our opening session is now coming to an end. So a big thank you to Dr. Henia, to Paul and to Nick for your hugely valuable contributions today. And uh, let's see how we can help to realize some of those critical actions as we plan together for 2022 to 2027 over the next two days. Uh, I think we are a, a different type of network of the non-usual suspects who are sitting together as UN agencies with the Red Cross movement, media development agencies, NGOs and specialized agencies. And we wanna challenge each other over the next two days. I think it's been fantastically reassuring to hear the emergency relief coordinators opening remarks. And I think that this uh, debate today will set us in good stead for the next two days. I am now going to pause as we conclude this session and we will wait for the next session to begin. Thank you very much.